is Bering Sea. Monster ships stalk schools of fish with precision and mechanical muscle. At 376 feet, the Alaska Ocean is one of the largest commercial fishing vessels on Earth. But in the North Pacific, size takes a back seat to high technology. The ship's bridge contains the latest in navigational gear and a series of monitors that display the cold, calculated hunt for fish. Sometimes you can get 100 tons of fish inside of five or 10 minutes. Every piece of electronics we've come to rely heavily on, and, and you hate to see any of them go out. It's called fish-finding technology, and it's revolutionized commercial fishing. The main advantages are if you can get out and find a fish, you're, you're saving fuel, you're saving time, you're saving wear and tear on your boat. It was World War II that opened the door on finding fish. The sonar developed to hunt enemy submarines is now making fishermen more efficient. The key to survival in a heavily regulated business. Thousands of miles from Alaskan waters, the White Dove too fishes for tuna out of the historic port of Gloucester in Massachusetts. The regulations that are required for fishing these days range everywhere from how many days you can go fishing, uh, how long you can stay out, how many fish you can have on board of a particular species, etc., etc. And uh, with many of these guys down to 50 days a year, I mean, you have to be very efficient, get on the fish, find the fish, turn around and come home and, and minimize your days used at sea. Small fishing boats also depend on the latest in fish finding gear. A fish finder or acoustic echo sounder transmits a sound echo or ping from a transducer straight down to the ocean floor. So your pulse goes down if it hits a fish. Generally what it's transmitting off is the bladder, the air bladder inside the fish, which will vary between species. Certain fish will look stronger at certain different frequencies, and they'll use those different frequencies to help differentiate between species and the like. A more sophisticated omnisonar uses multiple transducers that ping 360 degrees around the vessel. What that allows you to do is see the targets, depending on the frequency and the range that you've selected, that allows you to see the targets around the vessel, as opposed to the echo sounder, which shows them under the vessel. But pinpointing a school of fish is only half the picture. The computerized chart plotter has replaced paper nautical charts. With a system capable of using global positioning, to map, monitor, and record the ocean bottom in 3D. So now by just glancing over at the chart, you can see yourself positioned on the bottom. So you can record where you've been, you can put marks where certain features are. Maybe there's a wreck there, which tends to collect fish, or damage nets, you know, which you may want to avoid. Today, fishing on a tight schedule with pinpoint accuracy is mandatory for a small commercial fisherman to stay in business. But this centuries-old tradition may have endangered itself. Overfishing or the severe depletion of certain fish species threatens both man and nature. According to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, about 60% of all commercially important fish types are fully exploited, overexploited, or depleted. But the fishing continues while one reality doesn't change. Commercial fishing remains one of the most dangerous occupations in the world. Working on a constantly moving platform with the threat of rogue waves and sudden devastating fires, fishermen face potential disaster every day they set out to sea. The evolution of fishing gear in North America begins with a fish weir. In 1913, during the excavation of the Boston subway, workers unearthed a Native American fish weir, dated at nearly 4,000 years old. The weir resembled a fence, with an estimated 60,000 stakes used to trap fish during low tide. In the 16th century BC, Egyptian fishermen were fishing from canoes with barbed hooks made of bronze. 
and a variety of nets to scoop and corral fish in large numbers. Commercial fishing began on an international scale in 12th century Europe, and the major maritime nations began venturing farther from their heavily fished seas. In 1497, Italian mariner John Cabot was contracted by England's Henry VII to find the passage to Asia that had eluded Christopher Columbus. Instead of a new trade route, Cabot found a landmass he named Newfoundland. Along this foreign shore, he discovered a treasure greater than gold, cod. And reports went back to Europe of incredible stocks of cod. And the phrase that was used was uh, that you could scoop them up with a basket. Um, and when Europeans heard about this, it, it, it created, you know, a kind of a rush, like a gold rush, a cod rush, uh, to North America. Cod was one of the most valuable fish in the world. Its flavorful white flesh was highly prized. Salting and drying the flesh could preserve it for months, yielding a food that was 80% concentrated protein. A good fishery was like a good oil field. Tremendous uh, profits were being made from North American cod. So it was ideal for explorers, for uh, provisions for armies, and in fact, it became viewed by the British and by other countries as a strategically important material, material of war. Soon, the French, British, Spanish, and Portuguese were building long-range fishing fleets to begin an all-out commercial assault on the North Atlantic cod. The cod ranged from the waters of Newfoundland's Grand Banks all the way to what is now Cape Cod, Massachusetts. The salt codfish that soon was being caught in great quantity and shipped back to Europe was being traded with the Spanish for their gold because salt codfish was the only protein that you could preserve in those latitudes down there. The technology of fishing in open seas changed little for centuries. Cod was generally caught by hand lining, a method by which one man used a line, a weight, and a baited hook to catch and haul in a single fish. Hand lining from dories dates back to the 16th century. A dory is a small rowboat lowered over the side of the mothership to return only when full of fish. Commercial dory fishing was extremely dangerous. A storm would come up and the dory would get blown downwind from the schooner. And if it was a little foggy, it would be out of sight. And there would be a drift three or 400 miles from land with essentially no food. And, and, you know, that was it. Often, the catch would get so heavy that at a certain point, the small boat would just sink. The mothership would try to fish these guys out, but uh, in the North Atlantic, most of the year, you can't stay alive more than a few minutes in the water. Uh, so it was incredibly dangerous. But the rich cod stocks became vital to colonial America's economy. New Englanders made immense profits trading salt cod to the world. It eventually brought financial independence from the British and therefore helped establish the United States of America. But the march of technology finally shifted the worldwide demand from salted fish to fresh fish. In the late 19th century, the birth of steam power put engines aboard ships. Soon, steam and eventually diesel-powered fishing vessels were plying the oceans and scooping up fish in large trawl nets, effectively speeding up the delivery of the catch to market. Then, in the 1920s, a New York inventor named Clarence Birdseye changed fishing forever when he unveiled a fast freezing technique to the world. The fast freezing process completely changed fishing because it meant that fish could be taken inland in a country like the United States with a huge interior. This meant a tremendous increase in the market. By 1948, the world's commercial fish catch reached 19 million tons. It jumped to 60 million tons in 1960 and 100 million tons by 1989. Hundreds of years of relentless fishing in the North Atlantic resulted in catastrophe. 
In 1992, Canada declared a moratorium on the Grand Banks cod fishery, one of the most productive fisheries for over 500 years, was now depleted. While overfishing in most of the world's oceans is now a reality, a few conservation-minded scientists are fighting back by using behavior modification to keep juvenile fish out of the net entirely. The port of Gloucester, Massachusetts, is the oldest fishing harbor in the United States. If seafarers have fished the far-off waters of Georgia's Bank and the Grand Banks since the 17th century, many never return. Overlooking the harbor is the Fisherman's Memorial, a tribute naming thousands of local fishermen who have lost their lives at sea including the six men who perished in the infamous Halloween gale in 1991. Their story was told in the book and the 2000 feature film, The Perfect Storm. Linda Greenlaw was on the outer edge of The Perfect Storm, skippering the Hannah Bowden, the Andrea Gale's sister ship. We had 70 knots of wind for a couple of days. It was bad. It was not life-threatening. But I was very frightened. Listening to the boats west of me, these are guys who've been fishing all their lives, the Andrea Gale eventually succumbed to the 100-foot seas and 90-knot winds. Commercial fishing is always on the top of the list of the most dangerous professions, and a lot of that, of course, is due to bad weather. Commercial fishing is one of the toughest professions on the face of the planet. Um, these are individuals who go hundreds of miles away. They work around the clock. They operate under uh, changing conditions, often under horrendous uh, conditions. And it, they really are, I guess, the last of the, the true hunter-gatherers. Far from shore, smaller boats are more susceptible to nature's fury. In fishing ports up and down the East Coast, many of these small boats are called draggers. Draggers are bottom trawlers. Vessels that tow a large net along the ocean bottom, targeting ground fish, such as haddock, cod, whiting, and flounder. Today's bottom trawler pulls the funnel-shaped net at a three-knot average speed. Guiding the net on either end are otter doors. These heavy metal devices force the net to the bottom and provide hydrodynamic spread to keep the net's mouth open. Floats positioned along the headline keep the net open vertically, while a weighted ground rope and rubber rollers keep the net in contact with the ocean bottom. As fish are overtaken, they're guided into the collection area, known as the cod end. While popular, bottom trawlers are outnumbered by vessels called purse saners. Saners target high and mid-water schooling fish, such as tuna, salmon, and mackerel. In past centuries, seine nets were deployed from beaches. Fishermen rode the long nets in a semicircle around a school of fish, while horses pulled the catch to shore. Today's open ocean purse seines can reach a length of one mile. The net is motored around a large school of fish. When the circle is complete, the bottom purse line is pulled in like the strings of a woman's purse, trapping the fish. The net is tightened, and the fish are removed and brought aboard for cold storage. Purse seining and bottom dragging are highly effective, but at the same time pose environmental threats. The primary threat is known as bycatch. If you put a net into the water, you're going to catch a number of things that you are not targeting, and then those are, are thrown back into the, the water at the end of the, the end of the tow. And globally, we waste some 30% of everything that's caught uh, that is not targeted. In eastern Pacific waters by the 1960s, vast numbers of bycatch dolphins were dying in Persanes meant for tuna. Because dolphins often school above the fish, fishermen targeted the mammals to catch tuna. 
public outcry in the United States eventually pressured Congress into passing the 1990 Dolphin Safe Act. Today, the label indicates that government observers certify that tuna has been caught without harming dolphins. This is achieved by physically lowering the float rope to allow the mammals to escape the net. While the Dolphin Safe program has been very successful, limiting other types of bycatch is often more difficult. The National Marine Fishery Service monitors commercial catch quotas and bycatch limits. But scientists and fishermen often don't see eye to eye. This impacts the way they make a living, their profitability. And there was a lot of confrontation, I think, for a long time between us and them, as the us versus them. Uh, and they're on the water every day, and they see things. And so we started what's called cooperative research, working with the industry, and it's become a more open process. Cooperative research pairs actual commercial fishermen with scientists to develop new conservation-minded fishing techniques. Most recently, this partnership has resolved a highly publicized emotional bycatch issue, the fate of the endangered sea turtle. For many years, shrimp trawlers were responsible for the catch and often the subsequent deaths of various sea turtle species. The National Marine Fishery Service responded with a device that has now required gear on shrimp trawl nets. It's called a turtle excluder device. Basically, it's the first simple. It's a grid. It's usually made out of aluminum or stainless steel. It goes into the net. You put a hole below it. And so what it does is the turtle hits that grid and just it shoots out of the net, either top or the bottom. But the grids are big enough so the fish go through. The Marine Conservation Program at Massachusetts Manomet Center is dedicated to reducing bycatch in the problematic New England fisheries. So what we have been trying to do over the, the years is to develop more targeted, more selective fishing practices that allow us to catch only the things that we want to catch, that there's a market for, and release everything else underwater unharmed. The New England haddock fishery has long been plagued by the unwanted bycatch of the severely depleted Atlantic cod. The two fish frequently swim in close contact. Using fixed underwater video cameras, Manomet scientists studied the behavior of cod and haddock as they entered the net. They found that haddock usually react by swimming higher in the water. So if they enter the net at a higher level, then we're able to put a separator panel in the middle of the net, which will direct all of the haddock into the cod end where we retain the fish and all the cod will go out underneath. A more far-reaching problem is the bycatch of all species of juvenile fish. Regulations forbid catching small young fish because of the potential damage to the stock's population. A larger net mesh size has helped curb some bycatch by allowing juveniles to escape the net. But scientists are now trying to improve results with behavior modification. We know that most of the reactions of the fish are mediated through the visual system, so if the fish see what's around them, they try to, to avoid it. We inserted into the net something that we think would look like the large looming mouth of an approaching predator, so we simply put a black tarp inside the net. It causes all of the fish that encounter it to try and escape through the meshes. Um, the small ones are capable of doing it because they're small enough to get out of the meshes. While still in its infancy, fish behavior modification is offering promising solutions to the bycatch problem. This fish psychotherapy may someday go high tech. This may uh, involve things like using uh, laser lights to direct fish to a much smaller cod end um, so that we're not towing a whole net. Uh, or we might be able to use uh, holograms of some description to, to get fish to react to those. There, there are lots of things that we haven't even dreamt of yet. While scientists are learning how to better preserve wild fish species, others are domesticating them in an effort to build the high-tech fish farm of the future. For thousands of years, commercial fishing followed a hunter-gatherer tradition pursuing and harvesting fish in the wild. But an explosion in world population 
and the reality of overfishing have promoted a newer vision of the commercial fisherman. This fisherman doesn't catch fish, he farms it. In 1970, U.S. commercial aquaculture was in its infancy, with most farms raising trout, catfish, or carp in inland ponds or holding tanks. Worldwide aquaculture contributed just over 3% of all fish production. By the year 2003, it was contributing more than 30%. In the 21st century, the salmon is the king of the aquatic barnyard. The near-shore farming of salmon is a booming business, with vast underwater cage complexes located in calm water bays and estuaries in places like Norway, Chile, and the coast of Maine. But large-scale nearshore farming isn't the perfect solution. The environment could be the casualty. Salmon raised in pens are raised in very high densities. And just like with human beings, when you have a lot of people together, a lot of fish together, disease tends to run rampant. And then these diseases get out to the wild populations and can cause them significant physiological stress. A more typical issue is dealing with huge amounts of fish waste. Salmon aquaculturalists need places that have clean water with very little pollution. The irony of needing these clean water places for salmon is that salmon then in turn end up polluting the very water that was chosen for its uh, pristine nature. The impacts that were noticed were primarily impacts on the seafloor. So fish feces, uneaten food, settling on the seafloor, changing what was you know, a natural environment into an environment that was degraded. Salmon farmers are sensitive to these problems, and attempts have been made to reduce environmental impacts. But with 28% of the world's wild fish stocks either overfished or nearing extinction, aquaculture must overcome its drawbacks to help feed an expanding world. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, has vowed to increase the annual value of U.S. fish farming from $1 billion to $5 billion in the next 25 years. We have to look at the combination. How does the wild and agriculture fit together? So there's no doubt that agriculture has a place in the future. Is it controversial? You bet. Right now it is extremely controversial. One group of scientists is going where no fish farmer has dared to cultivate. Researchers with the University of New Hampshire's Open Ocean Aquaculture Program hope to neutralize some of the environmental impacts by moving the farm miles out to sea. I think the offshore environment is actually a better environment for a lot of the species that we're thinking about culturing. You got a lot uh, more stable conditions in terms of the temperature and salinity. You got a lot of water movement so that there's always clean water and well oxygenated water. And on, on, on the environmental side of things, you get a lot more dispersion of any kind of waste, both fish waste and any uneaten food. After years of experiments with flounder and haddock in smaller cages, the team has built the first commercial scale farm containing over 35,000 of the famous Atlantic cod. But the scientific challenges of building an open ocean cage that could withstand the biggest New England storms were daunting. When it came to mooring systems, we took an approach of developing modeling tools so that we could understand um, how you would attach these things to the seafloor, what kind of anchors, what kind of ropes, where the stresses would be. Three 3,000 cubic meter cages were assembled by divers and sunk to a depth of 100 feet. Nine one-ton anchors and heavy-duty chain hold the deep sea farm in place. Once the farm was up and running, thousands of cod fingerlings began their two-year lease in the blue water cages. But raising the brood of wild cod in captivity was uncharted territory. So video cameras were installed to monitor the nursery. The deep sea cameras are controlled remotely to observe the societal behaviors of the captive cod. The researchers implanted small sonar transmitters inside a number of fish. And then we have hydrophones or listening devices inside the cage, and we can then track these fish 24 hours a day, track their motion throughout the cage, not only where they go, but how fast they're swimming, and understand what their behavior is, 
and what their swimming speed is relative to feeding, relative to day-night differences, relative to interactions with other fish. Because the farm is over 10 miles from shore, feeding the cod requires the latest in high-tech room service. A lone automated feeder buoy sustains the colony. By periodically stocking the buoy with fish pellets, the researchers are able to pump measured quantities of feed into the cages. Inside the buoy is the remote-controlled brain that rings the dinner bell. So we've got to have all the control mechanisms, all those solenoid valves and so on that open and close all these valves, turn the pumps on. So it's really a giant computer that's out there operating all these mechanical systems. And what's nice about it is we can do that from the computer here at the university. The Open Ocean Aquaculture Project represents a quantum leap in fish farming. But it too has potential environmental impacts. One of the greatest challenges is oxygen depletion. Farm-raised fish excrete ammonia, which depletes oxygen. Well, right now, we can't measure it beyond the rim of the cage. We haven't seen any oxygen depletion. But then again, we have 35,000 fish out there. The farm of the future will have a half a million fish. Understanding what happens on a small scale and then building it out is going to help us predict what happens in a real commercial operation. But even as fish farms get bigger, the world will continue to depend on wild-caught fish to feed its growing masses. And in one remote fishery, there is a factory at sea that without restraint has the capability to strip the oceans of their fish. Hundreds of miles from shore, in frigid Alaskan seas that can produce wave heights of 50 feet, the modern factory trawler gives chase to a school of pollock. Some of these massive catcher processors have the ability to catch, process, and freeze more than 500 tons of fish in a single day. It's one of the reasons that a vessel like this is so large, is that we take our production facility to the fish, rather than bringing the fish to the production facility. While salmon was and is still a lucrative Alaskan fish, for decades, few considered the boundless offshore populations of walleye pollock, Pacific cod, and whiting in the Gulf and Bering Sea. In the 1950s, factory trawler fleets from the Soviet Union, Japan, and other countries began fishing these remote waters. As time went on, uh, and other people here in the Northwest understood that those fisheries were worth a lot of money, and that we could bring a lot more of those dollars home to the beach, home to America, if we extended our jurisdiction out to the 200 mile. It wasn't just the fisheries decision, but it was a good decision for fishermen. Until 1976, most nations observed a 12-mile territorial boundary at sea. Then Congress passed the Magnuson Act, and the U.S. established a 200-mile exclusive economic zone. So did many other nations. The U.S. proceeded to evict the foreign fleets. At first, American fishermen worked in joint ventures with foreign factory vessels. Until the early 1980s, when the U.S. launched its own factory trawler fleet. When those vessels began coming around, we began essentially taking over the entire fishery and moving the, for the foreign fleets off the 200-mile zone and opening up a whole new kind of fishing in Alaska that we hadn't seen there before. Based in Seattle's Puget Sound, today's fleet of catcher processors travel to Alaskan waters for two fishing seasons. In the winter, in late summer. While there are only 15 active vessels in the entire fleet, their catch capacity is unrivaled. In 2002, the factory trawlers and smaller catcher vessels landed more than 1.5 million tons of pollock, some 40% of the entire commercial fish catch in the United States. At the time that these big vessels were being developed, there were, there were great technological advances going on in hydraulics, high-pressure hydraulics, uh, gear, big trawl winches, and certainly electronics. Also in the material that the nets were made out of, spectrofiber nets, very similar to Kevlar and things that you would make bulletproof vests out of. 
with a price tag approaching $100,000. Some of these mid-water monstrosities have a mouth nearly as wide as a football field is long. The Alaska Fishery Science Center makes and repairs a variety of trawl nets. This is a four-seam bottom trawl using the ground fish fisheries in Alaska. This net is towed by a boat of about 700 horsepower. Typical factory trawler in Alaska is closer to 2,500 to 3,500 uh, horsepower. This is a lot smaller than you'll see on those boats, but it's of the same shape, just a smaller version of it. Protecting many trawl nets from damage and maximizing their spread radius underwater is the duty of wireless acoustic sensors mounted on or near the otter doors that pull the net. What these sensors do is, is send back information about the geometry of the trawl. These are door spread sensors. One of them is placed on either door and you can get the distance between it and you can see that your, your trawl is flying stable. And this increases the efficiency of the fishing operation drastically. This pollock fishery, fortunately, is the cleanest fishery in the world. And we catch almost 100% pollock. So it's very important for us, too, to keep it clean. Fishermen often refer to the cod end of the net as the money bag. Knowing when the giant bag is full underwater is critical to avoid smashing the fish with an oversized load. These are catch load sensors right here. And the way that these work are as the bag fills up, naturally it gets wider this way. These lines start taking some strain. And you'll see this oftentimes it's called sausage. As that happens and these open up sideways, it pulls and it trips this and sends an acoustic message back to the skipper and says that at this point there's fish up to this point in the bag. And when this happens, the skipper knows that I have a 100 ton bag, I've got 100 tons of fish, and it's time to haul back before I cause damage to the net. Because the processing factory below deck runs 24 hours a day, fish must be caught at a rate that matches the factory's ability to process and freeze it. Automation for us is of the essence. It's extremely important because we don't have a lot of room on board for people. We're limited by the amount of people we can put on a vessel this size. So anything we can automate, we do. The vessels that we operate run somewhere between 15 and 20 tons of fish an hour. And on a pace that produces roughly 100 tons of finished goods a day. After sizing and weighing the catch, the removal of skin and bones begins. We can process 120 fish a minute through a fillet machine that will produce a boneless, skinless fillet and that's done without any interaction with the fish other than the driver placing it into the machine. So sizing of the fish and then a proper adjustment of the fillet machine is a critical thing for us. The human eye checks the machine's work as the fillets cross the candling table. Here, workers check for any skin or bones that remain. From this point, the fish will become one of two products for the end consumer. The majority are pressed into formed fish fillets that will end up as fast food sandwiches or fish sticks. The other product is called surimi. Surimi was originally created as a form of storage for fish without refrigeration. The process of creating surimi is a process that removes the soluble protein and oils from the fish protein. This fish paste is later used to make imitation crab meat and many other manufactured foods in the Japanese market. When onboard processing is complete, the fish products are quickly frozen and then delivered to the ship's massive cold storage hold. When the hold is full, the fishing ends and the vessel heads to port for unloading. Throughout the 1990s, a combined yearly harvest quota for Pollock turned the Bering Sea into a high-stakes commercial fishing tournament. The fishery was open for everybody to fish as fast and as hard as you could until the quota was caught. There was a real pressure, not only from fishermen, but from the environmental community to end what they call the race for fish. But by the end of the 20th century, the Bering Sea Pollock fishery underwent a drastic change. Today, the competitors are now teammates as a cooperative is now in place to eliminate overfishing. But when more than a million tons of pollock are being harvested in a single year, it's up to a new generation of fisheries scientists
to make sure this fish will never share the fate of the Atlantic cod. At Seaview Lobster Company in Kittery, Maine, a harvest of prehistoric looking bugs is sorted, weighed, and prepared for overnight shipment to points around the world. Commercial lobstering is a $300 million a year business, one of America's highest value fisheries. But the lust for lobster has a very short history. Well, lobsters are always regarded as a, as a trash species. Years ago, they used to wash up in windrows on the beach, and people would, would harvest them, carry them home, and spread them in the fields as fertilizer. They were always fed to the slaves and the servants, and, and they were considered a very low-level dietary item. As time progressed, people seemed to develop a taste for them. They became more and more popular. By the late 1800s, their value skyrocketed, and the great lobster hunt began. And then as the fishing picked up, the numbers declined fairly rapidly, but the unusual thing, the surprising thing is, despite all the fishing pressure, the lobster populations have not declined much in the last 50 years, I'd say. At the University of New Hampshire, zoologists are trying to determine how lobsters are resisting fishing pressure in an attempt to better forecast their future. One part of the research uses video cameras placed inside the traps. The static lobster trap has changed very little. It still depends on the lobsters to capture themselves. We found out that although many lobsters approach traps, many lobsters go into traps, we actually end up catching very few of those lobsters. The time-lapse cameras revealed that the lobster fishery thrives on inefficiency. The most striking thing is that lobsters are climbing all over these traps. It's like a little anthill. Once a lobster gets into the trap, it prevents others from entering while it's feeding. They can escape fairly readily. 90% of them get out. We call it the restaurant theory that they're just stopping by, they're having something to eat. They occasionally get caught and pulled up to the surface. But many, many of them got away. This has implications of why the fishery is so robust. Right? We're not removing as many lobsters as we might be able to remove if we had very efficient traps. By mounting sonar transmitters on lobsters, the scientists are able to remotely monitor movement and gain valuable information on behavior dynamics. In the inefficient New England lobster fishery, catch levels continue to be high. But inefficiency plays no part in the $2 billion a year Alaska pollock fishery. Here, absolute efficiency is the key to conservation. The National Marine Fisheries Service has revolutionized the science of population dynamics and forged a rare partnership with the commercial fishing fleet. We conduct uh, annual stock assessments where we uh, estimate the productivity of the resource and from that uh, make recommendations to the North Pacific Council on, uh, on harvest levels for the coming year. Scientists estimated the pollock population at 12.3 million tons in 2004. Based on legal catch limits, fishermen harvested 1.64 million tons, or about 13% of the total population. Counting fish and arriving at the all-important harvest maximum is a major undertaking that requires human observers, acoustic science, and a little fishing. The net shed at the Alaska Fishery Science Center in Seattle builds and repairs massive trawl nets for scientists turned fishermen. We use these nets for stock assessment purposes. We go out, we catch fish, we make the same toes year after year, and then we get a feel for uh, the stocks are going up, they're going down. We take samples, we look at the biology, we take link frequencies, we take sex of, of the fish, and then you get a feel for what the aggregate of the fish are and the health of the stock in that area. One highly specialized fishing vessel is the Miller Freeman, a floating research laboratory capable of finding and counting fish in a five million square kilometer area of the Bering Sea. We run a uniformly spaced parallel transect pattern. It's basically like going out and mowing the yard, but collecting acoustic data and information from net catches along those parallel transects. And what we do is we use the scientific echo sounder as well as trawls, large nets, either midwater nets or bottom nets, to sample the acoustic targets that we encounter. 
The researchers chase large schools of pollen to sample population density and the ratio of juveniles to adults. The final part of the equation is the NOAA Observer Program. As in most U.S. fisheries, trained observers are placed aboard many commercial vessels to get a first-hand view of the intended catch. And the unintended bycatch. Well, their principal responsibility is to collect information on catch quantity and composition, to document that, and then to send it forward. There are bycatch issues that really affect fishing opportunities. And in some cases, fisheries can be closed or curtailed because of bycatch of salmon or halibut. Observers transmit a near real-time report on catch composition and any bycatch issues. This information is reviewed by commercial fleet managers in Seattle, who can then immediately redirect the fishing to an area without the bycatch problems. This relationship between fishermen and scientists is critical to the health of America's largest fishery. But the Alaskan waters are unique. Today, nine of the world's 17 major fisheries are considered overfished or threatened. Rather than saving them, better technology may be leading to their demise. I think since World War II, that technology has increased so much. Sonar, depth finders, got greater speed, you know, just so many things that made fishing more effective. Efficiency is devastating to a fishery. What efficiency means is that uh, you produce more with fewer people. Ideally, a fishery should be doing just the opposite. They should be catching less fish and employing more fishermen. But the Bering Sea may predict a different future, one that combines efficiency and science to harvest yet safeguard the ocean's bounty. For every 15 pollock we catch, there's still 85 of them swimming in the Bering Sea, even though we catch over 1.3 million metric tons. So when you have a golden goose like the North Pacific, it, it really is not in the best interest of the industry to kill the thing off. In some U.S. fisheries, conservation is a major priority. Aquaculture and better fishery science will hopefully take pressure off wild stocks. But without proper management, the future for all fisheries may be an empty net. Meanwhile, a determined group of men keep fishing, struggling to maintain a proud tradition in nature's threatening and threatened seas.